Then, six weeks after Katie moved in, Alyssa noticed that Stephen started sleeping on the floor of Katie's room every night, and she thought this was weird. She decided to confront Stephen about this, and he just snapped at her. He started screaming at Alyssa, and then he just stormed out of the house, and Katie followed him. Hey everyone, welcome back to What Happened with Jackie Flores. I'm Jackie and I'm super, super excited that you guys are listening to my brand new podcast. The feedback has been absolutely amazing and I appreciate all the support that you guys have given this podcast. Also, my friend Anya is here. She's going to be hearing the case for the first time just like you guys. So if you hear her making like comments or like little questions, that's why. Today, we're going to be talking about what happened to Katie Platel, her baby Bennett, and her adoptive father, Anthony Fusco. What makes this case so upsetting is that Katie was supposed to be reuniting with her birth family, and instead of this being a happy and joyful moment, it resulted in her murder. What happened is just so upsetting. It'll make you angry. It'll make you confused. There is just so much information to go over, so let's jump right in and talk about what happened to Katie Platel. Katie was born on January 29th, 1998 in New York and was actually originally named Denise. At eight months old, she was put up for adoption and adopted by Anthony and Kelly Fusco, who then changed her name to Katie and raised her in Dover, New York. The Fuscos also had a biological daughter named Nicole and they decided not to tell Katie that she was adopted until she was an adult. Anthony was an officer with the New York State of Corrections and Kelly was a secretary for Dover's land use department. Katie lived a very normal and and stable life with them. She was deeply loved by her parents and by her sister. She was a gentle soul and she loved animals so much that she actually was a vegetarian. She loved all animals but she especially loved cats and she would often take care of stray cats that she found. Katie was creative, smart, and clearly very kind. Katie also really loved to eat. In fact, her uncle Carrie called Katie Pac-Man because she was always eating and she was always snacking. She was an aspiring artist known at her high school for drawing comic strips and she planned to pursue a career in digital advertising. She also had a blog and in one of her posts she wrote that a pen and something to draw on became a safe place for me. She also said in the post that a life without art is no life at all. Now, Katie's plan after graduating high school was to go to Dutchess Community College and then transfer to SUNY Purchase in New York City. Katie just really seemed to be thriving with her adopted family. So Katie actually lived her whole life not knowing that she was adopted until her 18th birthday. This is when Anthony and Kelly finally told her the truth. Now, this might seem like a lot for someone to take in, but Katie actually took it very well, and she became curious about her biological parents right away, and she wanted to know more about them, which I feel like is is normal. I feel like if you find out you're adopted, it's normal to be curious about who you actually come from. Now, that's not always people's reactions to news like this, but Anthony and Kelly were fine with Katie wanting to know more about them, so they gave Katie her parents' names, which were Stephen and Alyssa Plato. As soon as Katie figured out their names, she went on Facebook, she searched Stephen and Alyssa Platel, and she sent them a message. And the Platels responded to her. Katie started communicating with Stephen and Alyssa regularly, but didn't meet with them, at least not right away. Katie also learned that she had two younger biological sisters who were 7 and 10 years old. After a while of back and forth messaging, Katie set up a meeting with the Platels, and Stephen and Alyssa seemed thrilled to see their daughter again. Katie met with Stephen and Alyssa after high school graduation in June of 2016. Now this meeting went better than expected as Katie hit it off with her parents right away. So much so that in August of 2016, Katie gave up her dream of going to college and actually moved in with her biological parents and their two other daughters who were eight and 10 at the time to their home in Virginia. Wait, whoa, that seems like a lot. Weren't these people basically strangers to her? Yeah, honestly, it does sound like a drastic change, but I guess Katie just really wanted to bond with her biological parents, and they did too. Katie's adoptive parents, Anthony and Kelly, were concerned about this, mainly because they wanted Katie to go to college, but ultimately they respected her decision. I mean, after all, she was 18 years old, so Katie was allowed to do whatever she wanted. Katie moved in with her real biological parents, and although they were happy to get to know their daughter, things between Alyssa and Steven were not well. At this point, the pair had decided to separate. They were even sleeping in separate bedrooms. 
Alyssa said that she was suffering emotional and verbal abuse by Steven and that she was always walking on eggshells. He was always in a mood. She didn't know when he was going to be happy. She didn't know when he was going to treat her right or when he was going to explode. They just were not happy and there was a lot of yelling in the house between the couple and in front of the children. Steven was just not a good person. Alyssa actually told Katie privately that her father had abused her as a baby and that was a major reason as to why they put her up for adoption. Because again, Alyssa wanted to keep Katie safe. She told Katie this information, but according to Alyssa, she didn't seem too concerned about this. There was just so much going on in everyone's lives. This was a big adjustment. I mean, imagine reuniting with your daughter that you gave up for adoption 18 years ago. It was a lot. So obviously, Alyssa was doing her best to adjust to this new situation. Katie was also doing her best. However, Stephen in particular, his behavior started to change drastically. And the reason for that is because Katie and Steven's relationship became incestuous. I know. And on September 1st, 2017, they actually had a baby together named Bennett Pladel. Yes, Katie had a baby with her biological father. Um, what? Yeah, we'll get there. But first, let's talk about what happened on April 11th, 2018. Katie called Steven on Skype, breaking their no contact order to tell him that their relationship was over and she officially broke up with him, with her dad. This made Steven angry and he called his mother Grace at around 7 p.m. and told her that he was coming to pick up Bennett from Grace's and that then he was going to take him to see Katie in New York and then leave him with her. But that wasn't true. And this really should have raised some red flags for Grace because Bennett was supposed to stay in her custody and she knew that legally Stephen and Katie were not supposed to see each other. But she gave Bennett to Stephen and Stephen took Bennett back to his house and murdered him. So that was a premeditated murder then. Yeah, it was. And it just really shows how calculated Stephen was because he had to lie to even get Bennett and basically pretend that everything was all normal and fine when he talked to Grace. After he just murdered his own son, Stephen got in his car and he drove all night to Dover, New York. That's over a nine hour drive. The next day, on April 12th, at around 7 a.m., he called his mother Grace and told her that he was almost to Katie's house to drop off baby Bennett, which of course at this point we know is a lie because he already killed the baby. Stephen arrived outside of Anthony and Kelly's home where Katie was staying and he parked his minivan across the street at a liquor store. Stephen then watched the house and waited. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, Katie had a cleaning job where she would go to her grandmother's house in Connecticut and Anthony would always drive her there. So when Stephen saw Anthony and Katie get into the pickup truck and drive away, he followed them. There's actually surveillance of this and just watching it go down is so eerie. You can see Anthony and Katie drive by and Steven is just parked there waiting for them to move and then as soon as they drive past him, he quickly just rolls out of the parking lot and follows them behind. It's just scary because you never know who's watching you. So he was waiting for them to leave the house. Mm -hmm. But how would he know about this routine and like know they were going to be leaving? Yeah. Well, yeah, it's believed that he definitely did know about Katie's schedule, meaning that they were probably in contact more than just one time. So when Anthony stopped at a stop sign in New Milford, Connecticut, which was approximately a 25 minute drive from their house, Stephen pulled his car up next to theirs, pulled out an assault rifle and repeatedly shot into their car. Katie and Anthony were both shot multiple times in the body and in the head. After that, Stephen just drove away. He called his mother Grace at around 8.45 a.m. and told her that he had just killed Katie, Anthony, and baby Bennett. He told her that he wanted her to call the police and let them know that he had done this. And he also asked her not to go near his house where Bennett's dead body was. Of course, Grace freaked out and she immediately called 911 and told them that her son Stephen had murdered his baby, his wife, and his wife's father. The 911 call is actually available online and Grace just sounds so distraught while saying this. She explains to the police that Katie had broken up with him the day before and that she was in New York and that he was going to bring baby Bennett there. But instead of actually bringing the baby there, he killed everyone. Meanwhile, some witnesses also called 911 to report someone opening fire in the New Milford area. 20-year-old Katie and 56-year-old Anthony's bodies were found at 8.40 a.m. And at 9 a.m., police discovered 7-month-old Bennett's body in a closet at Stevens' house in Nightdale, North Carolina. Although this isn't 100% confirmed, it's believed that Bennett died due to suffocation. 
After this, police searched the state for Stephen, but it was actually a probation officer who spotted Stephen's van at 9.15 a.m. back in Dover, New York. When police arrived, they discovered that Stephen was dead in the passenger seat from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Wow, so his plan was always to kill himself too? Why didn't he just kill himself? Like, I don't understand why he had to I, kill everyone else. I literally don't get it either. But there's actually a term for what Stephen did called a family annihilator. And this is a term that has been around since the 80s. This is a category of murderer who typically kills most of their family members and then in 68% of the cases they also kill themselves. There aren't a lot of specific warning signs. Of course most of these offenders do have violent histories but in cases like this they're typically always committed by the father of the family and like in Stephen's case they are planned murders rather than spontaneous violent acts. Okay, I know that was a lot to take in. So a lot happened between Katie moving in in 2016 and then the murders happening in 2018. But even more happened before that. So we're gonna go back to the beginning with how Alyssa and Steven met. Steven met Alyssa in 1995 in an internet chat room when Steven was 20 years old and Alyssa was 15. They started chatting and began an online romantic relationship, if you wanna even call it that. But really, Steven was grooming Alyssa. He lived in New York York at the time and Alyssa was living in San Antonio, Texas. They wanted to be together in real life, so Alyssa actually ran away from home to go live with Steven in New York. She became estranged from her family and she really only had Steven. Now, typically, abusers want their victims to be isolated from friends and family so that they don't have a support system. That way, they won't and most likely can't leave them. Soon after they started living together, Alyssa became pregnant and at 17 years old, she gave birth to a daughter named Denise on January 29th, 1998. When Denise was eight months old, Stephen and Alyssa put her up for adoption. Now, the reason Alyssa put Denise up for adoption was because she wanted to protect her. Alyssa was still a teenager, so she was struggling financially and she also wanted to get Denise away from Steven. She claims that Steven was physically abusing baby Denise. She said, he would do things like cover Denise's mouth when she would cry, he pinched her all over her body, and he turned her black and blue a couple of times. Eventually, he said he couldn't stand the screaming and crying anymore, so he started placing her into a cooler or into an ice chest. Sometimes he would put a blanket in there to keep it cracked open. Sometimes he would just shut it and he wouldn't let Alyssa go back to open it. Alyssa said, he would make me wait a few minutes until I could go back and I'd open the cooler and Denise would just be gasping for air, drenched in sweat with bruises on her. I would just scoop her up and shut the bedroom door so he couldn't bother me and I would rock her back and forth and tell her how sorry I was for the life that she was having. Alyssa also said that Steven never picked up Denise and would scream at her, especially when she cried. Now, early instances of abuse during infancy can have a drastic impact on a child's development and adult life. Being adopted was hard enough, but Katie was also dealing with invisible trauma caused by Stephen that she wasn't even aware of. Now, Alyssa was too scared to tell anyone about what Stephen was doing, but she knew that she couldn't let this happen to her baby. So that's when she decided to put Denise up for adoption, and Stephen went along with it. Obviously, this was difficult for Alyssa to do. You know, it's difficult to give up your baby, but she knew that she had to do it because she wanted Denise to live and to have a happy life. Now, Alyssa did end up staying with Steven and they eventually got married in 2006. After that, they moved to Richmond, Virginia and they had two more daughters. Wait, why did she stay with him and have more kids with him after all of that? I know, it's it's might be shocking to most of us, but Alyssa says that at the time she thought that Steven had changed, or at least he was getting better because he didn't treat the other daughters like how he treated Denise. But Steven was still angry and abusive. He would yell at everyone, he would storm aggressively around the house, he would throw furniture, and Alyssa said that he did this in front of their daughters. And just so everyone knows, breaking things and throwing things is still a form of physical abuse because it's a way of the abuser making a threat to the victim that basically they could hurt them if they wanted to. Now, on top of being abusive, Stephen also couldn't even keep a job, so Alyssa had to work multiple jobs to support their family. One day, Stephen beat a neighbor's cat to death with his own hands and tools just because he didn't like cats and it walked into their garage. Wait, isn't that a sign of a sociopath or a serial killer? Yeah. 
Well, I feel like it definitely is a symptom of that. And Steven actually just threw the dead cat into the garbage. So he definitely had no remorse for what he had just done. Also, there was a time when one of their daughters, who was three years old at the time, peed her pants and Stephen yelled at her and made her stand in the tub with her clothes on and wait for her mom Alyssa to come home after work to clean her. Alyssa said when she came home her daughter was terrified. She was shaking and crying and she was still covered in urine. That's not how a parent should have left her. Stephen also called their older daughter the R word constantly because she had some special needs issues. Okay, that has to be considered psychological abuse, right? I think we can consider it that or verbal abuse. Now, I just feel so bad for his daughters and for Alyssa, who probably didn't know at the time that she was also a victim of abuse. Okay, so now let's talk about what happened after Katie moved in with her biological family. So it quickly became clear that not all was well with Alyssa and Steven's marriage. They were sleeping in different bedrooms and they had already decided to separate before Katie moved in. Wait, so why would they have Katie move in? In if all of that was going on. Yeah. Well, it seemed like Alyssa was excited to reconnect with her biological daughter and to have a chance to live with her again. And I guess Katie must have felt the same way. Maybe them being close to separating was even more of a reason for her to want them to move in. It was really a final chance to live with her biological family. Alyssa really wanted to be close with Katie, but Katie seemed to be surprisingly forming a better bond with Stephen, her father. They would spend all day together because Stephen was unemployed and Alyssa had to go to work. Work. So basically, Katie and Steven were alone together all day long. Now, another thing that Alyssa noticed, which I mentioned earlier, is that Steven started to change. Not only did his attitude change, but also his appearance. He shaved his beard, he grew his hair long, and he started to wear tight clothing, almost like he was trying to look younger and cooler. Then, six weeks after Katie moved in, Alyssa noticed that Steven started sleeping on the floor of Katie's room every night and she thought this was weird. You know, Steven had his own room and Katie was 18, not a little kid. So there really was no reason for them to be sleeping in the same room. She decided to confront Steven about this and he just snapped at her. He started screaming at Alyssa and then he just stormed out of the house and Katie followed him. Which is just crazy to me. I don't understand why this was happening and I can't imagine how confused Alyssa was in that moment. I mean, imagine just seeing your husband sleeping in your daughter's bedroom every single night when she's a full grown adult. It's also confusing why Katie followed after her dad. I mean, it just seemed like their relationship was so much different than the relationship she had with Alyssa. So in November of 2016, just a few months into Katie living there, Alyssa filed for divorce and her and her two younger daughters moved out of the family's home. Now, Katie decided to stay at the house with Steven instead of going with Alyssa. How could Alyssa just leave Katie with Steven? Mm -hmm. Well, it was Katie's decision to stay with Steven, and it wasn't like she never saw Alyssa again or her other sisters. The two younger daughters would still come back to the house for a few days in a row because Steven and Alyssa were sharing custody of them. So this system continued on for a while, but maybe Katie wasn't really seeing Alyssa as much. Then on May 23rd, 2017, Alyssa came across her 11-year-old daughter's journal and decided to, you know, read a little bit of it. But what she read was shocking. The daughter had written about how Stephen told the two younger girls to refer to Katie as their stepmother and that Katie was pregnant. It also said that Stephen calls Katie baby and refers to her as his baby. This daughter also wrote in the journal how confused she was by this and that Katie is her sister and she wonders if Katie now thinks of her as a sister or as a daughter. I can't imagine how confusing that must be for the two youngest daughters. Imagine learning that you have another biological sister. She moves into the house and then your dad starts telling you to call her stepmother, not sister. It just doesn't make any sense. Now, Alyssa says that as she was reading this, she became hysterical. She immediately called Stephen and said, is Katie pregnant with your baby? And Stephen replied and said, I thought you knew, we're in love. Alyssa just immediately started to scream and shout at him. She was even cursing him out. She could not believe that a father would do this to his own daughter. And she told Stephen, you're sick, she's a child your child, your blood. However, Stephen really didn't seem to care. 
He told Alyssa that he had plans to marry Katie and that her adoptive parents already knew about this and that they didn't really like it at first, but that they had come around to accept it. Alyssa was so freaked out and she immediately called the Henrico police and they opened an official investigation just a few days later on May 31st. Investigators interviewed the two younger daughters and they said that Katie and Stephen slept in the same bed and that Stephen had told them that Katie was pregnant with his child. They also added that Stephen said they had to keep his and Katie's relationship relationship a secret, where kids at school would make fun of them. But obviously that was just a manipulation tactic so that Stephen wouldn't get arrested for incest. Soon after the investigation started, Katie and Stephen skipped town. They moved to a house in Nightdale, North Carolina. Once they were there, and since no one knew that they were related, Katie and Stephen started living openly as a couple. On July 20th, 2017, in Parkton, Maryland, Stephen and Katie, biological father and daughter, got married and this was just two months after his and Alyssa's divorce was finalized how is that legal well it wasn't on their marriage certificate application there's a question that asks you are you related to the person you want to marry and they said no so they obviously lied and didn't tell the truth about their relationship they had a small ceremony and their guests included Stephen's mother and Katie's biological grandmother, Grace, as well as Katie's adoptive parents, Anthony and Kelly. Which is just crazy to me. You might be wondering, why would Katie's adoptive parents go to this wedding? How could they approve of this? Well, they didn't really approve of it. I mean, I can't see how anyone would ever approve of this type of situation, but they felt like their relationship to their daughter was becoming estranged. The more they continued to tell Katie that this was wrong, that she should not be marrying her real father, the further Katie grew away from them. They were scared that if they continued to push her, they would push her too far. So I don't think they really agreed with this. I don't think they were proud of this, but they did not want to risk losing the relationship they had with their daughter. As for Stephen's mother, Grace, who I guess now off of the marriage is Katie's mother-in-law, even though technically she's her grandma, I'm not really sure why she went to the wedding. I really have no idea what her thoughts were during this. Now the entire wedding is just so disturbing and there's actually a photo of everyone together on the wedding day. Katie is wearing a short black dress, she's holding a bouquet of flowers, and her adoptive parents are standing on one side of her while she's standing next to her biological father, Stephen, her new husband. She's also super pregnant. It's just a lot to take in when you look at this photo. So Stephen wasn't lying to Alyssa on the phone. Her adopted parents did know about Katie and Stephen's real relationship. Yeah, they knew. I mean, they attended the wedding. And Kelly's brother later said that Anthony and Kelly didn't think there was anything they could do, so they decided to support Katie and their marriage. But actually, they definitely could have done something. Katie and Stephen's relationship was literally illegal, so they could have gone to the police. I don't know what their reasoning was for not going. Maybe, like I said, they just didn't want to ruin their relationship with Katie. Can we talk for a second about how this relationship even came to be? Like, why would either of them even be slightly romantically yeah. interested in one another? No, it's very confusing. It's shocking. But there is a thing called genetic sexual attraction, a phenomenon of intense sexual attraction between biological family members after a long period of separation. However, there is little scientific evidence to back the theory, and most people call it a pseudoscience. Maybe their relationship was a result of this phenomenon or Stephen's manipulation and grooming techniques. We'll never truly know. Now, besides marrying her biological father, Katie was also pregnant. And on September 1st, 2017, Katie gave birth to a baby boy named Bennett Plato. After the birth of their son, the two of them moved to a house on a cul-de-sac in North Carolina. Katie even posted photos on her Facebook page of her and Steven holding their baby. She even shared these photos on Instagram with the hashtags, hashtag just married, hashtag pregnant. It's really sad because Katie is a victim in this, so a lot of people judge her for this, and a lot of people are like, how is she like posting about this baby and about this wedding all happy when it's literally with her father? We just have to remember that Katie is a victim in the situation. We also know that Steven is an abuser, so we really have no idea what was happening behind closed doors. On November 29th, 2017, the Henrico County Police issued arrest warrants for both Stephen and Katie, and on January 27th, 2018, they were both arrested and charged for incest, adultery, and contributing to the delinquency of a minor. They were both issued a $1 million bond, and they were remanded to the Wake County Detention Center. Right after this, Bennett was put in Grace's custody. Stephen's lawyer told the media, this case is an 18-year-old girl who shows up at the doorstep of a 40-year-old man who 
who's going through difficult times with his wife. They have a bond because they are biologically related, but they never knew each other before they had a sexual relationship. He was head over heels in love with her so much that he outweighed the issue of them being biologically related. What? Like, I know lawyers have to defend their clients, but that's just not a good enough excuse to me. And I feel like it's even crazy that he said that. Like him saying that Stephen loved her so much that he outweighed, you know, the fact that it was his biological daughter and that he was going to go to jail is just crazy to me. So Stephen and Katie ended up getting out on bail and there was a court order saying that they were not allowed to see each other. They both had their arraignment on February 20th, 2018, but neither of them entered a plea and their preliminary hearings were set for April 23rd, 2018. Katie moved back in with the Fuscos, her adoptive parents in Dover, New York, while Stephen moved into a hotel in Virginia because he was actually barred from going back to North Carolina. However, on March 16th, a judge lifted that restriction and Stephen was actually able to return to his house in North Carolina, which was near his mother Grace's house. I honestly don't understand why they lifted that, but since there really weren't any restrictions on Stephen seeing his son Bennett, he was able to go to Grace's house and see his baby. And less than a month later, on April 11th, Katie broke up with Stephen, and well, we all know the events that followed. So yeah, I know that's a lot, but that's pretty much everything that happened between Katie moving in and the day that she was murdered. Now, apparently all of Steven's guns were supposed to be taken by police after his original arrest. But Alyssa says that she warned police that Steven was a very good carpenter and she believed that he could have made some sort of box, maybe one with a fake bottom or something that he used to hide his additional guns in. Alyssa also claims that she warned the police that Steven was violent and dangerous and that she feared for her own life after reporting him for incest. Clearly, the police weren't looking into this enough, and Grace should have done something when she knew that Katie and Steven were in contact. It honestly feels like this could have been avoided, and I really think that Alyssa should have informed Katie and Kelly about the abuse when Katie was adopted, so they could have stopped Katie from ever reaching out to Steven. Katie, her baby, and her adoptive father, Anthony, were laid to rest in upstate New York in April of 2018. One of the Fusco's neighbors, Shirley, said, We're all still in shock. It's crazy. I don't know what else to say. It's horrible. I mean, this was shocking to everybody. Can you just imagine that? You find out that your neighbor's adoptive daughter married her biological father and had a baby with him. And then the biological father murdered his daughter, their child, and the adoptive father. It's just insane. And again, my heart just breaks for everyone involved because this should not have happened. I just don't understand why this happened. Why did Steven have to murder his baby? Why did he have to murder his daughter? Why did he have to do any of this? It just doesn't make sense. Police Chief Lawrence Capps told reporters at the time, events like this are not common in our community. Unfortunately, they are not uncommon in society. We are heartbroken and saddened over the death of this child, and like you, we are trying to make sense of all the factors that led up to the senseless taking of life. Now, because Stephen killed himself, there was no trial, which leaves a lot of questions unanswered, at least to the public. Stephen's lawyer said that his client hadn't shown any signs that he was going to do anything rash when they spoke about a week before the killings. Stephen had asked him, you know, advice on what to wear to court and, you know, things like that. So in the lawyer's mind, he didn't feel like Stephen was going to do something like this. Honestly, his lawyer said that he didn't even think this case would make it to trial because he was stuck on how do you decide how to punish someone for this case? How do you punish a biological parent? by putting that parent in jail and keeping that parent away from the child? Like, I wish we could know if Steven started grooming Katie online before they even met in person, or why the adopted parents and Grace went along with the wedding. It just breaks my heart that this happened and that these three lives were taken away. While a lot of people blame Katie for what happened and they feel like she was wrong for the decisions she made, I believe she was a victim in this. You know, she was groomed by her father and even though she was 18, technically an adult, he was still the more adult in the situation and he knew better. He knew better than to marry his own daughter and to have a child with her. All Katie wanted was to reconnect with her biological parents, and somehow it led to her murder. It's not fair, it's not right, and she didn't deserve to die. Anthony and baby Bennett did not deserve this either. They were innocent in this situation, and my thoughts and prayers go out to all the family and friends involved in the situation. I am so sorry that this happened to your loved ones. I hope that Alyssa has been able to heal from this, as well as her two other daughters, because remember, Katie had two other sisters. They were also traumatized by this situation. I mean, imagine finding out that your older sister is having a baby with your father. 
Now there's also Anthony and Kelly's other daughter, their biological daughter, that they had before they adopted Katie. She lost her father in this situation, as well as her sister. I mean, Stephen really just ruined so many lives and broke so many people's hearts. While Alyssa still struggles to make sense of what happened, she wants to do everything she can to spread awareness about the gravity of incest crimes and domestic abuse. In her words, I'm grieving, I'm sad, I'm upset, but I also want to have something good come out of this. And I agree with her. I feel like people need to be more aware of incest and the signs of it and, you know, how to stop this because it's such a serious issue that isn't talked about enough. But all right, you guys, that's pretty much everything I have for today's video. I know it was a lot to take in and it was very shocking. I know that Katie's biological mother, Alyssa, tried to put an end to it. Her adoptive parents tried to put a stop to it and she was even arrested for this. So there were people trying to help her and do something, but I still feel like more could have been done and should have been done. I would love to know your thoughts on this case and if there's ever any other cases you would like me to cover, make sure to let me know by leaving me a comment under my YouTube video or messaging me directly on Instagram. Thank you so much for being here and for listening to Katie's story. Don't forget to follow, rate, and review What Happened wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe to my YouTube channel for full video episodes. You can find me on Instagram at the Jackie Flores and on TikTok at True Crime Jackie. Once again, thank you so much for being here and I will see you all in the next episode. Bye guys!